Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. As 2012 marks the centenary of Alan Turing's birth, we mark this occasion with two dedicated special issues in Philosophical Transactions A and Interface Focus. Samson Abramsky, the co-organiser of the Philosophical Transactions A issue, The Foundations of Computation, Physics and Mentality, The Turing Legacy, is here with us today to discuss these two special issues. So Samson, can you tell me a bit about Turing's early work on the Turing machine? and its contemporary significance today. Right, well, uh, Turing's uh, work in going back to 1936 on the Turing machine was really of fundamental importance. Uh, It was um, uh, provided the foundation for the whole modern theory of computation and also indirectly for a lot of modern computer science. Uh, It was a very bold step um, uh, and a fundamental one because um, This was in the context of pure mathematics and people had been talking about logic and formal systems for many years, but Turing introduced an abstract notion of machine in this setting, which was um, surprising and a real innovation. And what was fundamental about what he did was that for the first time he addressed the question of what in principle can be computed and what uh, the leaders of the field, people like Kurt Gödel, and others felt to be a really convincing fashion. In fact, Gödel was enormously impressed by this contribution of Turing's. So other people had given ideas about what could be computed in terms of various kinds of equations and more familiar sorts of mathematical um, notions, uh, which um, while they were while they were convincing in so far as the, the things that, that 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 did fall under those definitions clearly could be computed didn't really give a convincing argument that essentially anything that a person could compute could be uh, dealt with in this in this formalism and Gödel had specifically uh, rejected other other attempts to claim that some of these formalisms did give an account of the informal notion Turing's uh, notion of machine and the the analysis, the development of the ideas by which he came to the machine, starting in fact from the idea of a human computer working in uh, in an exercise book or something like that and following rules and leading on from this to this in the end mathematical definition of Turing machine was convincing and compelling in a way that no previous analysis had been. So this is a first fundamental point. It's a point which is Uh, discussed, for example, in the historical uh, paper by Professor Saw, which opens the the, the special issue. Um, So this was was an enormously important uh, contribution. And in fact, the notion of Turing machine is still being used today and is of great relevance in in the modern discussions of computational complexity and the famous P versus NP problem, which is one of the great uh, modern problems in mathematics and computer science. Together with this fundamental contribution, there were other aspects as well that were also uh, of enormous importance. One was the idea of um, the fact that programs could themselves be represented as data. So the program that controls a computer could itself be represented as data and manipulated by the by the computer itself. So this was a forerunner of the idea of the stored program computer, which is fundamental to everything that's been done with computing technology. And it also was of great mathematical importance because it led to the idea of the universal Turing machine um, and sort of fundamental results about uh, the halting problem and so on, which are really pillars of the subject of uh, computability theory. So this was all, um, these were all contributions that one finds in the seminal paper from 1936. Uh, The final thing I'll mention um, which also receives some emphasis in in various aspects in in the special issue, is the idea of the oracle that can be added to a Turing machine, uh, which has also proved to be very fruitful, particularly ironically in a way uh, as regards the the study of uh, what what is incomputable, which which is also of course an important consequence of Turing's work. Um, The fact that not only can we prove negative results, that certain things cannot even in principle be computed, but we can find structure and different levels of how hard things are uh, to to construct that go beyond the computable. Now the idea of the oracle um, is that uh, the the machine runs, but it has a kind of external 
agency. And in modern, modern computing terms, we can think of something like a database or a remote server or something. And you can ask it well-formed questions and it can give you answers. In mathematical terms, you can say, what is the value of this function on this argument? And it will give you back an answer. Now, how it does it is not known to us. It's, so it's a sort of device that doesn't itself have to satisfy the constraints of being computable. So we can consider a machine which runs like a computer but is enhanced by this, uh, this oracle, well named in fact, which, which is able to provide this information. And this allows us to lift the idea of computability in the absolute sense to computability relative to some given piece of information which may be of a mathematical nature or it may relate to some uh, application as well. And it's this which has proved the essential point in uh, allowing the ideas of computability theory to be elaborated into a very rich and deep mathematical theory. So all of these contributions come from uh, Turing's pioneering work in this area. And Turing was on for his work at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. Is the work he did still having an influence on computation and cryptography today? Yes, indeed. Uh, in fact, uh, we can say that since the Bletchley Park work, it's become unthinkable to think of cryptography separately from computers. Uh, and of course, there have been many very important developments since Turing's time. But what the, what the Bletchley Park work, in which he, along with many others, was, was deeply involved, of course, um, it, it's become clear that uh, um, the challenge that uh, cryptographic systems face is the challenge posed by high-speed computers. Um, and so the huge emphasis in, in modern cryptography has been on uh, resistance to um, methods that, that, that are based, that are computer-based. Um, and uh, in fact, um, the, the connection is very rich because um, also some of the ideas coming from Turing's fundamental work on computability, computability which we were discussing earlier, in their, in, in their sort of refined forms that refer to computational complexity. Um, so this is a, a development subsequent to Turing, but certainly inspired by, by, the, by the line of work that he started, where we ask not simply if something can be computed at all, but if it can be computed efficiently. And uh, so a lot of modern cryptography is based on the idea that in order for an attacker or an adversary against a cryptographic system to be able to break the code or to um, get, get hold of the information, they would have to solve a computationally hard problem. And so this leads to ideas of public key cryptography and so on. These are ideas that came after Turing, but the basic materials for this work uh, very much stems from his pioneering contributions. And going slightly further afield, we, we even have, in a very contemporary way, the idea of quantum uh, cryptography, where um, resort is where we go beyond the constraints of classical physics and use uh, quantum resources to get um, systems that may even have a higher level of security, which are not based on computationally hard problems. But I think the sort of mindset of the way that modern cryptography is set up is very much based on this pioneering work, actually coming both from the practical work done at Bletchley Park on actually breaking codes, but also the ideas, the general theoretical ideas about uh, computability, which Turing also pioneered. So in your introduction, you say that a key element of the Turing legacy is his work on information and intelligent machines. How do you think this work is impacting on research in the area today? Well, firstly, in his famous paper on computing machinery and intelligence from 1950, in some sense, Turing set out a prospectus for what eventually became the field of artificial intelligence. And this was very important. It's a remarkable paper in terms of its general scientific culture and attitude to a very difficult and delicate question because in some sense the idea of whether machines can simulate human intelligence cuts deeply to the heart of the nature of uh, the human mind and what we are and so on and also issues of identity as well so the the other strand that of course has become celebrated and is still very much with us is the idea of the Turing test so Turing's ingenious idea was rather than having to address some thorny metaphysical problem about whether a computer really thinks or has consciousness or whatever, we can, we can make a practical test. 
would we be able to tell the difference if we were having a, a conversation with someone we couldn't see? I mean, in, in, in the technology of that time, you know, exchanging messages over a teletype, and it's easy, all the easier to imagine it nowadays in, 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 in the current world of virtual reality and so on. So if we're having a conversation with somebody we, can, we can't see, can we tell if it's really a person or if it's actually um, a program, an artificial intelligence? And this is a very compelling idea. And in fact, there, are, there is an ongoing um, international competition uh, which runs annually where people submit their, their programs and um, um, one sees progress being made in some sense in, in terms of whether machines can pass the Turing test. Uh, of course, um, the, the path of artificial intelligence hasn't been smooth. It's always been a controversial subject because of these uh, sort of links with deep uh, philosophical and cultural issues. And of course, progress has also not been smooth and rapid because we're dealing with very difficult and, and fundamental questions and, and incredibly rich phenomena like human language and communication, human cognition and so on are, are going to take a long time to address in this fashion. But on the other hand, one must say that enormous progress has been made in many of these areas, partly as a result of the accelerating pace of computer technology and Moore's law. So the simple fact that computers have lots of memory and run very quickly now means that tasks to do with language processing and so on can be done quite impressively, at least at the sort of lower, lower levels. If we think of the sort of searches we can do, the, the approximations to uh, machine translation of natural languages that you can now get from um, various, um, well, Google and various other um, um, vendors and um, also a speech recognition and other, other such things, image processing. So um, a lot of progress has been made in these things. Um, Turing's contribution was not in the specifics, but in setting out a program and also in this intriguing uh, criterion, the, the Turing test, which is still the subject of philosophical debate to this day, in fact. It's also aroused enormous interest in philosophy as well as in the uh, science and engineering side of things. So certainly his legacy is still very much with us there. I, I personally think that one of the very intriguing comments in his paper, and it's a brief comment, not fully elucidated perhaps, uh, but, but to me it has some ring of tr deep truth to it, is that we have to be prepared to contemplate machines being able to make mistakes if we ever want them to be able to achieve a high degree of intelligence. Um, and um, I think um, some of the attempts to show that uh, in principle machines can never achieve intelligence don't take account of this, uh, this suggestion of uh, Turing's. So, um, so I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good example of where he was ahead of his time, percipient, and uh, his ideas are still very much with us. So in 1952, Turing published his paper, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, which provides the theme for the interface focus issue. Which aspects of his previous work do you think contributed to this paper, which spans the interface between chemistry, biology and mathematics? Well, that is indeed a difficult question because it's a remarkable leap, to, it, it would seem, uh, to go from the kind of work he had been doing previously, which was very much either in the sort of pure mathematics logic realm or the realm of engineering uh, physical systems associated with, with computers, to this uh, venture into biological modeling, which was also radically original as far as biology itself was concerned. So perhaps only somebody like Turing could have made a leap of that kind. I heard um, a, uh, some years ago, a spellbinding talk by Robin Gandhi, who was a close friend and associate of Turing's, which emphasized Turing's broad scientific culture. And I think that was something that, that was with him from a young age through his life. So I don't think he separated off different subjects from himself, and that must have, for himself, and that must have been part of why he was able to move uh, across what would usually be seen as disciplinary uh, barriers and boundaries. These were certainly not uh, barriers for him, but still it was a remarkable step. Um, which, and moreover, he did something, as I understand it, and I should emphasize that I'm by no means an expert on the 
uh, on the biology here, but, but as I understand, it was radically original in the field of mathematical biology itself. And my understanding is that whereas perhaps the specifics of the particular modeling systems that he put forward, and this was, of course, at a very early stage in the game, I mean, these, these have obviously, current work has gone far beyond these, but again, he proved perceptive and um, almost prophetic in pointing in what has turned out to be a very fruitful direction. And both on the side of more accurate biological modeling and on the side of exploring the mathematical richness implicit in the mathematical models, the kind of uh, reaction diffusion equations that, that Turing put forward, um, it, it, the, these have turned out to be extremely fruitful and, and may become major areas of research in their own right. So, and I think with pioneers, you often find that, that it works like this. They, they don't, I mean, they, uh, they make a remarkable leap and one doesn't see immediately in their, in their direct contribution the full potential of what is there. That has to be explored by successive generations of scientists who come afterwards. But again, he found the right direction. And where that came from, I, I do not know, but it's, uh, it's a remarkable thing. I just want to add one other thing, which is that, um, of course, although it was very different from the other work that he did, one cannot imagine that it wasn't in some way informed by his work on computation. And what we see nowadays, and really just in the last 10 years or so, is a remarkable flowering of an interaction between computer science and the study of computation on the one hand and biology on the other, a remarkable flowering of computational systems biology. And this is certainly reflected in the richness of the um, interface issue that uh, is also coming out alongside the issue on, on the computational topics. What we're finding is that there is computational structure in biology if one looks for it. After all, one thinks of DNA and sort of coding, uh, replication and so on. There's organizational structure at many different levels in biological organisms. And the things that we've learned about how to organize information uh, how it's represented and how it's transformed uh, in the world of computer science turns out to be, it seems, of increasing relevance in the study of systems biology in the modern day. So again, it's hard not to, not to imagine that somehow this spanning of Turing's, uh, Turing's different interests is, is also prefigured in, in, in his work. And how do you think this seminal paper has impacted on various scientific fields since its publication? Well, again, I, I must emphasize that I don't speak as an expert here, but I understand it has been deeply influential in the field of mathematical biology, both in terms of as a challenge to find more realistic modeling of biological systems, which has been carried very far forward. Uh, and, and I think some of this work is represented in this interface issue. Uh, and also that the mathematical models themselves, once elaborated further beyond the point that Turing had taken them have turned out to be very rich uh, subjects for uh, applied mathematical analysis, interesting things in their own right from that point of view. Um, I think also, uh, as I say, the computational modeling of biology in a, in a less direct way, um, but, but understanding that uh, change of form can be expressed in terms of more discrete kinds of dynamical system, uh, I think that also draws, in, uh, so with, one can talk about things like various kinds of uh, discrete modeling of uh, DNA um, rewriting systems uh, and um, L systems and other such things. I think this definitely takes Turing as a precursor, even if the technical connection is a little less direct. So I think in these different ways, we can see the effect of that work in current developments. Thank you, Samson, and thank you for watching this Foresight Publishing video podcast to celebrate the Turing Centenary.